Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the broadcast. As you guys know, we have no intro any longer, no five minute countdown because the YouTube trim feature, something in my hair, the YouTube trim feature is messed up. So we're gonna wait for like 10 seconds to get you guys in here. Okay, we are live, let me pause it here. We're gonna jump in. It's really weird for me not doing the five minute countdown, getting all my stuff ready. So that's why we're starting a couple minutes late to compensate for that. I have my chat ready. I'm excited for you guys. Tonight is gonna be a Book of Acts speed run. This is gonna be highly ambitious if I can do this. Now I didn't say I'm gonna be able to, but I'm gonna try to do all 28 chapters in 60 minutes. Let me know where you guys are watching from in the chat. Make sure that you like the broadcast. We're on episode 148 of the Monday Night Fire. So like, share, partner, monthly, do all that stuff. September 2nd, I'll be at Global Vision Bible Church for their annual deliverance conference. September 24th, I'll be at Without Walls Church in Mesa, Arizona. And I'll do all my announcements at the end of the broadcast. I'll answer questions and I'll talk because I want to jump right into it because of the new YouTube trim feature not working. We're going to jump right into the broadcast here and go into what our content's going to be and people can trickle in as they trickle in. Please make sure you share this as well. And I want to say this is appropriate for children. So this is appropriate for kids tonight. Make sure you have your notebooks out, have your Bible out. We are literally speed running this. We're going to be going through the whole thing. We're going to try our best to do it in 60 minutes and then we'll pray and we'll talk and we'll have fun and hang out at the end. All right. So let's start with the book of Acts. This is the Acts of the Apostles. And let me just make a few things clear. We're overviewing every chapter in the entire book. This is not verse by verse. This is to me, the key moments of every chapter, we're gonna to try to cover all 28 chapters and we're gonna to try to do like two to three minutes per chapter. We really have to do three minutes or two minutes per chapter, but we're gonna, some, the later books are quicker. The beginning books are longer. So it'll probably all make sense and work out. If you don't know, I have an entire verse by verse on the channel in a playlist. It's 13 videos over 15 hours of content that will be in the description. This is not that, this is not verse by verse. It's literally speed running through the book of Acts in 60 minutes. I've taken a lot of time to prepare for this. I hope it gives you a really good overview. I think it's going to be fun and exciting. I'm learning a lot doing these and preparing for these. So again, entire verse by verse in the description, which is 15 hours of content. Let's talk about the book of Acts and we'll, we'll go into the intro here. This is the Acts of the Apostles. Some Bible translations call it the book of Acts. Some say it's the Acts of the Apostles. This is basically what the disciples did after Jesus left them with the Holy Spirit. If you don't know, we have the Holy Spirit. We've been given the power of God. Let me know if you're hearing me type one in the chat. So the goal is not just do I encounter Jesus or experience Jesus as what do I do after that encounter? What did the disciples do after they experienced him? What did they do after they walked with him? It's more than just having a church service or a nice a nice meeting with Jesus, the power changes our life. Our everyday life is changed because of the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're not just looking for Sunday mornings. We're looking to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's change that happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. So that's the book of Acts. All that Jesus taught them, all that he told them, and then what he gives them is the Holy Spirit. Now is, well, what are we going to do? And what they're going to do, as we're going to see tonight, is turn the world upside down. Your goal is to turn the world upside down. You've been given the power of God and you have the power and the authority now to drive out demons, to lay hands on the sick, to make disciples, to baptize people, to see the transforming power of God. The Bible says not just in word, but in action applied to your life now. So I don't want a boring God. I don't want, I don't want to just live my life this boring, stale, dry, synthetic Christianity. I want to experience the power of God. The anoint let me know in the chat the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So I'm praying tonight as we go over this that we'd experience the presence and the power of God. Why? Why just read about it? Why just hear about it? Why not walk in it? There, there's a remnant God is raising up right now that is bold, that is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. The frontline Christians that God is raising up. It's an exciting time. Now, the interesting thing about uh, the book of Acts is it was written by a doctor named Luke. And I like how the most supernatural book of the Bible is written by a doctor. So it is possible to work in a logical field and live a supernatural lifestyle. The author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts writes anonymously. In fact, none of the writers of the four Gospels identify themselves by name. But church tradition as far back as the early part of the second century has always agreed that Luke was both the author of the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. But they don't, they don't identify themselves as the writer. But history tells us Luke was the writer. Luke is only mentioned by name three times. That's Colossians 4, 4.14, 2 Timothy 4.11, and Philemon verse 24. From these passages, we discover a few things. Um, we know that Luke was a well-educated Greek living in Asia Minor. We know that Luke was a Gentile 
Hello, God is using Gentiles. According to Colossians 4, we know that the only Gentile writer of the New Testament was Luke. So the one that wrote this was the only Gentile writer of all the New Testament. Again, he was a doctor. He was a physician. He was also a historian, um, gave specific dates. And according to Colossians 4, he was a doctor. His medical training shows because he uses technical medical terms. After he met Paul, Luke was the apostle's constant companion, even in jail. In 97 verses in Acts, the so-called we passages, when in 97 verses where Paul says we, Beginning in Acts 16, Luke is the person he's referring to. So Paul goes from using us to we, okay? Indicating that he's there. He's part of the action. Now, he's not an eyewitness to everything that happens in the book of Acts or in the Gospels, but we know that he, we, we know that by the Holy Spirit and by oral tradition and by other people witnessing, he was able to write these things down. In fact, Luke never saw Jesus, which is interesting he writes the book of Luke and the book of Acts, never saw Jesus. But the opening paragraph of Luke chapter one tells us how he got his information. Let me read that for you. It says, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. And then the, Luke one verse two says, they use the eyewitness report circulating among us from the early disciples, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I also decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus. So you can be certain about the truth of everything you're taught. So Paul, Peter, um, sorry, Luke says, this is an accurate account for you. And he's talking to Theophilus, but again, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is reminding him of things. The Holy Spirit is speaking to him and Luke is writing the book of Acts. Okay. He also heard about Jesus from the apostles and those that he spent a lot of time with. Luke's two books were written probably around 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. Some say about 80, 50 to 80, 60 around that time. Remember the disciples did not write the gospels immediately because they believed Jesus was coming right back. So they didn't think it was a need to write it. He's coming right back. And then also they, you know, once they realize, okay, he's not coming right back. Then they start writing down the gospels. Um, we know that like Mark was written around 80, 55, Matthew was written between 80, 50, and 80, 70. John was the last book that was written. Um, it's believed. We don't know for sure, but we know there's several reasons why they started writing these stuff down. Again, my hour hasn't started yet, okay, until I go into chapter one. So I'm just giving you an intro to the book of Acts. Um, a couple reasons why they were under heavy attack. Stephen and James had both been martyred. Paul was in prison awaiting trial. And many of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus were getting old and some of them were dying. So this is why and when the disciples started writing the gospels. Many of you think they wrote them right away or they wrote them as it was happening. It wasn't. It was again, 50 to 70 AD around. They start writing these gospels down because they realize, oh, Jesus isn't coming right back. Remember as a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And also they're being martyred. They're being persecuted. They're, some of them are dying. The eyewitness accounts that they need the information from. But I want to also key in on the Holy Spirit helped in the process of writing the details. Now you might think they would have forgotten, but look at what John 16 verse 13 says. When the Holy Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He'll bring glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said, the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. So we know the Holy Spirit will guide us. He will speak to us. He will reveal details. He'll, he'll show us the future. And this is what was happening. Um, again, this is a story of how Jesus continued his work after his death and resurrection. How many of you know the cross wasn't the end of the story? The cross was the beginning of the story. Because three days later, there's an, there was an empty tomb. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. This is what separates Christianity from all the other religions. Buddha, Muhammad, uh, none of them got up from the grave. But Jesus rose on the third day. So we know this is the difference. There's an empty tomb in Jerusalem. No other religion, no other group can say that. Acts is the continuation of that. It shows us Jesus in action as the head of the church. It shows us how people can know Jesus through the Holy Spirit. It shows us the origin of the church. The book of Acts is the blueprint of the church. Some say it's one of the most important books in the New Testament. I think all the books in the Bible are equally important. So it's hard to say what's more important. But this is the church's blueprint, okay? For all of you soft, salty churches out there that say, we shouldn't be praying for the sick or casting out demons. Uh, the church blueprint was they prayed for the sick, they fed the poor, they preached the gospel, they cast out demons. That is the blueprint. And no, this is not pre-recorded. we are live. Okay, that is the blueprint. 
So the so soft and salty churches that don't like the book of Acts, they don't preach the book of Acts, they think this was for yesterday or not anymore. There's no amen to the book of Acts. This stuff is absolutely biblically happening today. And I love this because it shows us the supernatural life is the normal Christian life. Hello, somebody say amen in the chat. The supernatural life is the normal Christian life. This is not something special that only some of us can walk in. This is the Christian life for all of us. It shows God's kingdom advancing in the earth. Preaching ha is happening. Miracles are happening. Demons are being cast out. And God's kingdom's advancing throughout the earth. The book of Acts shows what true Trish Christian life is like. This is what it shows. So let's, now that you've had an intro, now that there's 1,500 of you in here, please share the broadcast and help us get this out there. We're going to start in chapter one, and we're going to recap what every single chapter is about, the key points. We're going to miss stuff, obviously, but we're going to try to do this in 60 minutes. Acts chapter one, this is the sequel to the gospel of Luke, telling how Jesus is continuing his work. His uh, work For 40 days following his resurrection, Jesus is appearing to his people, proving he's alive, talking about God's reign, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and outlines his strategy of taking the message to the world. And the, that would be the Holy Spirit coming and empowering us. As, he, as Jesus taught about this, the disciples were going out and were actually going and doing the work and learning from Jesus. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 through 5 says, And being assembled together, he commanded them, Don't depart from Jerusalem. This is Jesus. After he resurrects, this is what he says. But wait for the promise of the Father, which you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So this is the Acts 1 is, that's that baptism promise, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, you're going to expand my kingdom throughout the earth. Wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power source of Jesus's ministry, and it must be the power source of our ministry. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit's power, why wouldn't we need the Holy Spirit? If Jesus was baptized and walked in the Holy Spirit with the Holy Spirit, why would we not need the power of the Holy Spirit? Remember, the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus at the Jordan after John's baptism. Jesus never preached or performed miracles publicly. He waited for the Holy Spirit to come upon him. When the Holy Spirit came upon him, that was the start of his ministry. In the book of Acts, hello, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, that was the start of their ministry. Imagine how many pastors wouldn't have a ministry if they waited for the Holy Spirit to start ministry because a lot of pastors are doing ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit because he does the things that we can't do. I can't preach. I don't know what I, I what to do. I don't know how to do it, but I, I rely tonight on the Holy Spirit to help me teach and to help me preach. His power transforms people. We don't just wait around and say, oh, well, I'm just going to do it without him. No, we wait for the Holy Spirit. We don't need to wait for a degree. We need to wait for the Holy Spirit. Okay, it's like I, once I'm done with four years of Bible college, no, you need the Holy Ghost. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. They weren't waiting for the four-year degree, which praise the Lord. I have a bachelor's in theology. I have a four-year degree. A lot of you heresy hunters in the chat don't know that, but praise the Lord. I didn't wait for the four-year degree to start walking in my calling. I waited for the Holy Spirit. Once I got the Holy Spirit, then I was able to go out and do the work. Let me just go through some of the things Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. Luke eleven thirteen, the Holy Spirit is given to those that ask. I'm going fast. John chapter three, verse five, the Holy Spirit is to give a person a new birth, a new start with God. John seven thirty seven, the Holy Spirit satisfies spiritual thirst. John 14, 16, the Holy Spirit is the comforter and the guide. John 14, 18, the Holy Spirit is Jesus living in believers, giving life and revealing himself. John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit reminds us of the teachings of Jesus. John 15, 26, the Holy Spirit is sent by Jesus and tells people about Jesus. John 16, 8, the Holy Spirit enlightens the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. John 16, 14, the Holy Spirit's job is to glorify Jesus and make Jesus known. Now, here's what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 9, 14, the Holy Spirit is eternal. That means he has no beginning, no end, and he's not limited by time. Luke 1, 35, the Holy Spirit works are acts of God. Psalms 139, the Holy Spirit is present everywhere. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, the Holy Spirit knows God's thoughts. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, the Holy Spirit is Lord and Acts 5, 3 through 4, to lie to the Holy Spirit is to lie to God. Here's the key verse of Acts 1. Acts 1, 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. There is power when you receive the Holy Spirit. That's what Acts 1 is about. You become a witness, not a lawyer. I say this all the time. A lawyer argues the facts of the case. A witness testifies 
what they have seen and heard. We're not lawyers. We are witnesses. We receive the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not called to argue. We're called to testify the works of God. Jesus then ascends into heaven. Angels promise in Acts 1, 9 through 11. They said, what are you guys looking up there for? And the same way he ascended, he's descending. There is a Jewish man coming back. Amen in the chat to planet earth. Am I preaching strong tonight? That's what Acts 1, the angels say in the same way he left, he's coming back. The disciples are going to spend the next 10 days. This is after 40 days of being taught, waiting for the Holy Spirit. That's Acts 1, verse 14. They all continue in one accord in prayer and supplication and, and the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And then we know also that they had to fill Judas's spot. There was a, fake, a vacancy in the apostolic team. So they had to fill Judas's spot. Matthias was chosen by lots to fill his spot in Acts 1. Okay, that's Acts chapter 1. We did that in four minutes. Some of these will go in one minute, so we're good, we're good to go. Chapter 2, we see the Pentecost happening. This is the Jewish Feast of Pentecost. This was the setting for the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2. The coming of the Spirit signaled the end of the Old Covenant and the beginning of a new covenant. I'm so excited about this. The Old Covenant is over. There's a new covenant, and this was the Jewish Feast of Pentecost that was going to celebrate that. In Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Again, this was a, Julie, a Jewish barley harvest. That's a tongue twister. Jewish barley harvest festival that was held in late May, early June, 50 days after Passover. Now, I don't have time to go into the whole history of 50 days after Passover. Just know, 40 days Jesus taught about the kingdom. Jesus ascends to heaven. 10 days they wait in the upper room that would equal 50 days that would be the time where the holy spirit was poured out and there's a whole significance to exodus 12 and 19 where the pharaoh let the people go and then exodus chapter 20 where god gave israel the 10 commandments on mount sinai and the mosaic and the law was called the mosaic covenant because god you know communicated through moses there's a whole thing about that this is a basically syncs up 50 days 40 days he's on Mount Sinai, he gets the law, it sinks up now to the new covenant, and this would be the outpouring where God is no longer writing on stone tablets, but God is writing on our hearts. Again, don't say slow down, guys, because we have 60 minutes to go through 28 books. This is an overview. I have a 15-hour verse-by-verse in the description, okay? So, 50 days after the children of Israel leave Egypt, God gives the Moses the Ten Commandments, the law is written on stone. 50 days after Jesus resurrects, God gives the Holy Spirit and now writes the law on our hearts. You see the, you see the parallel there and the, the archetype there? The Holy Spirit comes in wind and fire. The disciples are praising God in a new language. A, a crowd gathers amazed. How are these Galileans speaking our foreign languages? And the apostles start telling the people about the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Acts 2 verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So how many can be filled tonight? And we're going to pray that at the end for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Don't let me forget. There's 2,000 of you in the chat. How many can get filled tonight? All of you can get filled tonight with the Holy Spirit. Every single one of us can be filled. They all were filled. And again, this is not for yesterday, for just the apostles. This is happening today. It's going to happen tonight, and it can happen right now. Acts chapter 2, verse 16 through 36. Peter explained that this is all fulfillment of prophecy. This is what Joel spoke about. And, and Peter basically gets up while they're all accusing him. At 9 a.m., Peter says, how could we be drunk at 9 a.m.? Okay. This is not Las Vegas or Santa Barbara. No one's out here drinking at nine o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk. We're filled with the Holy Ghost. And then he quotes what the Bible says in Joel. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall, sh shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. This is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're not drunk. It's not, it's not alcohol. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's poured out. Miracles are going to begin to happen. Expect dreams, expect visions, expect sons and daughters to prophesy, expect the supernatural. Salvation is now, hello, offered to everyone. That's great news. That's something to shout about. We all now have the opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit and to receive salvation. And, then, and the men, their hearts were, were convicted. And they said, what must we do to be saved? And Acts 2.38, Peter says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What must we do to be saved? Peter says, repent. Once you repent, you should get baptized. Now, I'm going to show you in Acts 10 tonight, baptism is not required for salvation, but we should get baptized. We absolutely should get baptized. And then you shall receive, he says, the Holy Spirit. So very clear, you need to repent. 
You need to turn from your sin, stop breaking God's laws, turn away, and turn to God, turn directions, change the way you think. 3,000 people are added, and they started giving away their stuff. They started uh, meeting at each other's houses. If anyone needed something, hey, I have $10,000, you have $500, you need some money, I got plenty, I'll give you some of my money, you give me some of your stuff, we're gonna trade stuff, we're gonna give stuff away, I have tons of extra stuff to give, and everybody had their needs met. They were going home by home meeting. It was incredible. The numbers grew. The Bible says in Acts 2.42, they continued in the apostles' doctrines and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. All right, Acts chapter 3. We see the lame man at the gate called Beautiful gets completely healed. Basically, John and Peter got the Holy Ghost. And the question was, now that we have the Holy Spirit, we're going to do something about it. We're not just going to have the Holy Spirit. Acts 3 is where the Holy Spirit gets into action with the disciples. The action starts in Acts chapter three. And here's a man begging for money at the gate called Beautiful, begging in front of the temple, saying, I need money. And basically Peter and John say, silver and gold have we not, but what we do have, we give you in Jesus name. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. So he says, look, I know what you want, but I'm gonna give you what you need. Oftentimes as preachers, we should not give people what they want. We should give people what they need. They wanted money. But he knew they need, he, that the man needed healing. And in Jesus' name, this is the power of attorney, the power of his name, we're able to come as a representative of Jesus. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we can now come in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, and we can heal the sick. We see this in Acts 3. Again, there's no yesterday. Cessationism is a false doctrine. Don't believe the lie that the gifts were no longer for today. They're for yesterday. That's unbiblical. It's doctrine of demons. It's demonic. It tells God he can't do what he did in the Bible today. Cessationism, cessationism is a false doctrine. Absolutely, people can get healed today. We see this in Acts 3. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And the man gets completely healed. After the man gets healed, he goes with them in the temple. How amazing is this? If we started seeing signs and wonders on the street, if we started praying for the sick, casting of demons, people might actually want to go to the temple. They might actually want to go to church. We wouldn't have to hand them so many flyers and cards if we started walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, someone type in the chat. I want the power of the Holy Ghost. I want the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't want stale, dry, dead, crusty religion. This was the battle Jesus had was what the, with the religious people that loved their traditions but didn't believe in the power of God. I want the power of God in my life. I want the Holy Spirit in my life. I need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I can't live my life without the power of the Holy Spirit. How could we do it without him? So this was all Acts 3, boom, power of God. They heal the man in front of the gate by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, rise up and walk. He's dancing, he goes in the temple with them. And then Peter starts preaching in Solomon's, uh, in so basically in Solomon's, uh, how do you say it, Por porch? I don't know if that's the right way of the, uh, that you'd pronounce that original word, but he's preaching. The Bible says in Acts 3.11, now is the lame man who was healed, held on to Peter and John. All the people ran together in the porch, which is called Solomon's. It's kind of interesting, the wording in the Greek, but I won't go into that for time. Greatly amazed in verse 12 of Acts 3. So when Peter saw it, he responded saying, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why do you look at me so intently as though by my power or godliness, we made this man walk? So Peter tells us, look, look, look. It's not about Isaiah. It's not the power of Isaiah. It's not about a ministry. It is about the power of God. Don't look at me with amazement. Oh, how do you preach so good? How do you heal the sick and cast the demons? It's not me. Don't look at me. Why do you look at me as if I'm doing this? I didn't make this man walk, Peter says, Peter and John. This was God. This was the power of God. And so Peter's beginning to share that. And then Peter basically tells them for, for sake of time, remember that guy, Jesus, you killed? Remember the one that you guys all rejected and mocked? Oh, guess what? This is Acts 3. He's alive. He's alive. The guy you killed, he's alive. And now he's living in us and he's moving through us in power. The reason the man got up that was lame is in Jesus' name, the guy you killed living in me, we have power in Jesus' name. We have, type it in the chat, we have power in Jesus' mighty name. Chapter 4. The people are upset because these unlicensed apostles were teaching temple officials end up arresting Peter and John. They were brought to the rulers to defend themselves. Peter told the rulers Jesus was their only hope for salvation. So we think we thought Peter was a coward. 
they are like, well, you were the guy that denied Jesus, but now Peter has a boldness about him. He's in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's walking with courage. And I'm having fun tonight, if you guys can't tell. And now Peter is going to preach to the people. Look what he says, and I want to read this, Acts 4.15. But when they commanded to go outside of the council, they conferred among themselves saying, what should we do with these men? Remember, they've captured Peter and John for indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them. And it's evident to everyone that dwells in Jerusalem. We can't deny it. But so that this spreads no further, let's severely threaten them that from now on, they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them, do not speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John said, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. In other words, this is what they said. For we cannot but speak of the things which we've seen and heard. So when they further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them. Because of the people, since they all glorified God, would have been done. For the man was over 40 years old who the miracle had been performed. Their hands are tied. Everyone saw the miracle. We want to arrest these guys and threaten them, but... It's all threats. We can't do anything because everyone saw the miracle. So all we can do is threaten them. We have to end up letting them go. And Peter and John are like, why would we listen to you over God? Literally, if God's telling me to do this, why would I listen to you? Some random religious people. They're warned, never speak again. But they're like, no, we're going to keep speaking. Uh, Jesus answers their prayer as they pray together. A shaking happenings. They get a shaking happenings. There's another outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They're meeting together. The Bible says in Acts 4.31, and when they prayed, the place where they were at was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So they're in prayer now. They go back and they start praying. The place shakes. They get filled with the Holy Spirit again and they all go out with boldness. And they pray, and their prayer was for signs and wonders. Lord, show your show people among us that you're with us. And God answers their prayer almost immediately in Acts 4.30. So, for all of the people that say you can't get filled with the Holy Spirit more than once, remember in Acts chapter 2, verse 4, this is what the Bible says, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 4, they were filled again. So, yes, you can be filled twice. I'm believing for to get filled again tonight. Why would you not get filled twice was, this was a second filling for some of them, and it was actually uh, a fresh baptism for others. In fact, for some of the disciples, it was a third filling because Jesus blew the Holy Spirit on them. They received the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Now, chapter 4, they're getting filled again. It's biblical to get filled multiple times. Acts chapter 5, we're moving. Ananias and Sapphira, you guys all know them. They basically lied saying they sold everything and gave all of it. Peter said, you've lied to God, and they both end up dying. Now, the issue with Ananias and Sapphira was not that they didn't give everything. It was that they acted like they gave everything when they only gave a part. It was all about lying. And I just want to say this. I'm not going to say God is going to kill you, but how many of us live in a way where we act like we've given everything to God when we've really only given a part of our lives to God? Remember, they acted like they gave God everything. We've sold everything. We gave all. It wasn't that they had to sell everything. In fact, there was no command that they had to sell and give everything. Problem is they lied saying they gave everything when they only gave a part. So God doesn't take lightly people that say they give everything, but have only given some things. Be very careful when you say, I've given everything to God, when you've really held a lot back. This was the problem with Ananias and Sapphira. How, how many of us are half in and half out? Now, I'm not talking about material, sell everything and give it to me. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you're literally half in and half out, saying you're all the way in. It's a dangerous thing. So we know that they end up getting killed. But what's interesting is in Acts 5, I just want to throw this in, it says they were filled by Satan. Filled, F-I-L-L-E-D. While in Acts 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So now you have people that were filled with the Holy Spirit. A chapter later, they lie and they're filled with Satan, the Bible says. Now, some would argue saying, well, there's no way they, were, they weren't really Christians. And my rebuttal would be, Name one person you know that's not a Christian that sells everything and gives a portion to the church. They were absolutely at Christians. There's no biblical evidence that they weren't believers. Why would, and, and then, okay, so one, name one person that sells everything and gives it to the church. And then number two, show me one place in scripture where God kills an unbeliever for lying to him. Okay, because a lot of people say, well, you know, this, this doesn't mean Christians could have demons because, you know, there's no way these people weren't believers. Okay, so show me where else is God killing people, unbelievers that lie. He's not. They were absolutely believers. There's a whole teaching on this, but just know they were filled with the Holy Spirit and then filled with Satan. 
Christians could absolutely be filled with demons. Absolutely, if you open the door, you lie and you do sinful things, you can open the door to the devil. And in this case, they opened the door and the devil came in. All right. Christians meet at Solomon's porch. Miracles happen because what happened with Ananias and Sapphira. Actually, people were afraid to join the disciples. Fear swept. But even though fear swept the, the city from what happened to Ananias and Sapphira, the church still grew. They healed the sick and those that were demonized, demons were cast out. They brought the sick onto the streets. I want to make this clear really quick before we move on from Acts 5. They led, laid them on beds and couches and they believed that if at least Peter's shadow would fall on them, they might be healed. Now, I want to say something. Everyone always says Peter's shadow healed the sick. I used to say this for years. I would say, I want to be like Peter and my shadow would heal the sick. But actually, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say Peter's shadow healed them. It's saying that people had so much respect and honor for these men. This was a desperation. They wanted to lay them there believing that their shadows would heal them. But the Bible doesn't explicitly say that Peter's shadow healed the sick. Although it says they laid them so that just Peter's shadow might fall on them. Let me read you it exactly for those of you that are confused. Acts 5, 15 through 16. I'm going to read it word for word, New King James. So they brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered around the city, surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those that were tormented by unclean spirits were healed. So it doesn't say at all, Peter's shadow healed them. It just says they brought him just, if Peter's shadow would just fall, like if we could just get, it was really about if we could just get close to these guys, then maybe they could be healed because they saw what Peter and John were doing and healing the sick. Um, but again, the Bible doesn't say that Peter's shadow was healing people. I'm just, I know it makes some of you mad when I, I was like, wait, what? When I was studying verse by verse book of Acts and I realized that I was like, hmm, I've preached that wrong for many, many years. Okay. So the disciples once again, get arrested. This is going to be the theme of the book of Acts and they're in a council. There's a religious man named Gamil. Basically in a nutshell, he says, look, if these men are of God, we're going to end up fighting God. If these men are not of God, they'll fizzle out. Let them go because we don't want to fight God. And Gamil convinces the council to let them go, and they end up leaving with basically just a beating. They end up getting lashes. Some say 39 lashes. Um, the disciples walk out bloody and bruised backs. This is what, and, and, and the response is they rejoice because they're counted worthy of their suffering. They're going to continue to do this. This is incredible. Acts 6 and 7, some of these chapters I'll put together because they connect and they're dialogues of things going on. And it won't make sense if I do Acts 6 and then Acts 7. So I'm going to do Acts 6 and 7. We see seven spiritually mature, basically practical minded men were chosen from the community to take care of the church's poor. The apostles pray and lay hands on these men and turn them over to work to feed the poor. And look at what Acts chapter 6 verse 3 says. Therefore, brethren, seek out seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who you could appoint over this business. We will give ourselves to prayer and the word and this, the, and, the, uh, and the saying, please the whole multitude. So long story short, the disciples were like, look, we're, we have to preach. We have to equip God's people. We can't be out feeding the poor. We can't be out helping the widows. We need to be in prayer and the word. We need to find men that can feed the poor and help the widows so that we can be dedicated to prayer and the word. This is what we should be doing as leaders and pastors. My goal should be being in the prayer and being in the word so that when I come before you guys, I have something to offer you guys. So they were saying, look, I can't be out feeding the poor all day and then try to get on the live stream and have no, nothing to offer you guys. And sometimes I'm just going to say something as a general statement. Don't be like, oh, I know who he's talking about. Just stay with me. There's guys that do incredible ministry. They're out on the streets, street preaching, feeding the poor, laying hands on the sick, and they're incredible. They do incredible ministry. They're out on the streets, casting out demons. They have awesome demonstrating ministries. But then they try to teach the word or preach, and they just can't preach or teach. They don't, they don't know the scripture. They don't know the word of God. And it's like, hey, bro, you keep doing what you're doing, but don't try to teach and preach. Not everybody has to teach like this. But if you're dedicated to that, you should be in the word and in prayer. My main goal is being in the word and being in prayer as much as I possibly can so that I can teach and preach because that's what God's called me to do. I'm not out feeding the homeless, although we do feed a lot of homeless through the church. We give away a ton of food every single week. My main goal is prayer and the word because, again, if I am out doing that, so we appoint people to do that. There's people that do that for the ministry. That is what was happening in Acts chapter 6 and 7. 
they get seven men of good reputation. So you have a lot of guys, they're out feeding the homeless and they try to preach and they just can't preach or teach the word of God. And it's like, hey, just that's your calling to feed the homeless. My calling is to teach and preach the word of God. That may change, but right now that's my calling. So we have other people that do that while we focus on this. Doesn't mean we can do it occasionally, but it's not our primary goal. Uh, it's not the pastor's job or the preacher's job to do everything. We're called to be devoted to prayer and the ministry. Now, Stephen, one of the seven, who was incredible at proving Jesus was the Messiah, when they couldn't win an argument with him, they started getting a plan before the Sanhedrin to start making up fake charges to ca to basically arrest him, okay? As Peter's defend as Stephen's defending himself in court, his face begins to glow, and he, he showed from it showed from history that God not only now is in temples, and this is the whole, whole argument Stephen gives, but God is dwelling in people. So this is the argument, Acts 6.15 through chapter 7. This is the council. They're sitting there looking at, looking at Stephen. He's defending himself against it. Now, Jews associated a glowing face, face with a person close to God. Now, Stephen's on trial for his life, and he experienced that glowing face, and they all know now, wow, God is with this guy. But even though they're, they're going to end up still martyring him. So he talks about how David wanted to build a house for God, but Solomon built the temple. But building a house to contain God is impossible, Stephen says in Acts chapter 7. Stephen's entire case he's going to present in Acts 7, because that's really what all of Acts 7 is. Four main points to Stephen's case before the, the court, okay, is this. God's presence and work cannot be confined to the boundaries of Israel. Meeting God is no longer limited to a man-made house or a holy place. True faith doesn't need a holy place or a visible structure. It only needs the word of God. And then the fourth lesson he tells them or point was, Israel has a history of rejecting God and idolizing man-made structures. And in the same way, Israel constantly rejected God. This is what they were doing to Stephen. Stephen will become the first Christian martyr. And since Stephen's death, millions have been killed for the gospel. Jesus, and, and Stephen's being martyred really mirrored the things that Jesus said on the cross. Jesus said, Father, I commit my spirit. Stephen prayed, Lord, receive my spirit. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Stephen said, Lord, don't charge them for their sin. So there's really a parallel here between what Jesus said on the cross and what basically Stephen said as they were stoning him. Okay, that's Acts 6 and 7. Acts chapter 8. The day Stephen dies, Saul launches a crusade to destroy the church. Many men and women are jailed, killed for their faith. Many of them escape and they're in villages and the outskirts of town talking about their faith, preaching everywhere, the Bible says. The Bible says they were scattered everywhere, preaching the word. Now, instead of persecution stopping the church and stopping them, it actually helped them. It actually spread the gospel. So they're out preaching everywhere they go. There's no longer limits thanks to persecution. If there was just persecution, they would stay where they're at. But now that there's persecution, they're able to spread the gospel. So if you're being persecuted, use it as a sign. It's not going to stop me, but it's going to fuel me to tell people about the gospel other places. You got fired for preaching? Guess what the beauty is? You can get a new job and preach at your new job and reach new people. That's what persecution does. What the devil means for bad, God turns around for good. The early Christian historian Tert Tertullian said this, the blood of the martyrs is the church's seed. So we know that, boom, they're preaching. Acts 8, Philip goes, performs signs and wonders. Now, real quick, Philip is the, and it's so hard for me not to go like 20 minutes on every chapter, but I'm trying to go quick. Philip is the only named evangelist in scripture. That means he was Philip the evangelist. Okay, there's other evangelists, but they weren't named evangelists. Philip did three things. He preached the gospel, he cast out demons, and he healed the sick. Philip the evangelist, for all you churches that are like, Healing the sick and casting out demons isn't necessary with evangelism. That's not what the book of Acts says. Philip is preaching the gospel, casting out demons, and healing the sick. And the Bible says there was great joy in that city. Now miracles are happening. Demons are being cast out. There's a man named Simon the sorcerer who's impressed by what was happening. Peter ends up outraged, basically rebukes him and says, let your, your money be destroyed what you're thinking because he's trying to buy the power of God. And he says, please help me, pr pray for me. Um, then an angel tells Philip to take a, ro a hike down to Gaza where he would end up getting a ride with an African official and would end up preaching to him and then end up baptizing him. Acts chapter nine, when the Christians were escaping Saul's persecution in Jerusalem, he chased them to Damascus. On the way of chasing Christians and killing Christians, 
he ends up getting converted. Jesus appears to Saul, which would become Paul, turns his life around. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9, verse 1, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples, went to the high priest and asked for letters from the sin from him to the synagogues of Damascus. So if he found any who were of the way, women or children, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he was getting Christians killed. He ends up now going from being a terrorist, literally, to being an apostle. He encounters Jesus, Acts chapter 9, verse 3. The Bible says, a, a, sh a light shone from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So when they were persecuting the Christians, God took it as, you're actually persecuting me. That's how, look, oh, this is good. It's so hard not to preach this, guys. You, I know I'm doing a speed run here, but it's hard not to preach this. When God saw Paul persecuting the Christians, God says, you so represent me that you persecuting them is persecuting me. That's how serious God takes it. God takes you so serious. God says, when people wrong you, they wrong me. When people persecute you, they persecute me. So now Saul immediately, he gets blind for three days. His eyes end up getting open and he starts preaching. He immediately starts preaching. And we're going to see him preaching. We're going to see God moving. All the, all the other disciples are afraid of him. And thankfully it all worked out. God answered his prayers and the church accepted, uh, accepted Paul. Okay, we're going to do Acts 10 and 11 together here. Cornelius, a God-fearing Gentile in Caesarea, was told by an angel to go send for Peter. Peter's in Joppa. Peter sees a vision uh, that basically God confronts his prejudice against Gentiles and prepares him to go preach to, the Cor to Cornelius. And then in Acts 10, 14 through 16, Peter said, Not so, Lord. God gives Peter a trance, which the Bible calls, as he's falling asleep, a trance of unclean meat. And God tells Peter, eat the unclean meat. And then in Acts 10, 14, Peter says, No, I've not eaten anything unclean or common. And a voice spoke a second time, what God has called clean or cleanse, do not call common. Now this was done three times and then the objects were, objects were taken to heaven. Basically this, God says, you're no longer under the arbitrary laws of the Mosaic law calling meat unclean. The prohibitions of not eating certain type of meat have ended. Now you can eat these things. God told for all of you that are like, we shouldn't eat pork. Listen, I love you. I appreciate you. And it's, it's probably healthy to not eat pork and not eat bacon and all that. But I just want to say, don't try to use the Bible because the book of Acts, God literally gives Peter a vision of unclean meat and says, eat the meat. And Peter says, I'll never eat the meat. No, God says, eat the meat. Don't call unclean what I call clean. So I'm sorry to tell you guys, bacon's clean to God. Don't say po pork is unclean and bacon is unclean because now in the new covenant, it is okay to eat. It is clean. We're no longer under the prohibitions of the Mosaic law. Just want to go into that. I'm not going to go into all the details of that. This is what Acts chapter 10 tells us. And then Peter's at Cornelius's house. He's preaching to Cornelius's family. Remember Cornelius, these are Gentiles here. These are so far, we don't know. Let me just say in a way you can understand. We don't know if this works. We don't know if this works for the Gentiles. We're not sure if the Holy Spirit's for the Gentiles, if they even get the Holy Spirit or receive the gospel. Peter's about to find out, oh yeah, the gospel works for everybody now. Not just for Jews or chosen people, the Gentiles now. As Peter's preaching, this is Acts 10, 44. The Bible says, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. The Holy Spirit, and, and Peter was astonished. He's like, wait, these people are not even circumcised. And they're speaking in tongues, magnifying God. And then Peter answered in verse 47 of Acts 10, can anyone forbid water? These should or that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay a few days. So Peter's like, um, I know this is against the rules, but they've already received the Holy Spirit. Should we just baptize them in water? Can it, is, it, should any, is anyone going to stop me or can we do this? So important to note, don't get mad at me. It's not salvific. We can still be friends. A lot, some of you think that you have to get water baptized or you're not saved. Some of you believe that if you get saved and you drive home and you're getting baptized the next day and you die in an accident, you're not saved because you didn't get water baptized. That's not what the Bible teaches. Right here, this debunks that. Acts 10, they receive the Holy Spirit. They're speaking in tongues before they're water baptized. So unless you're telling me you can be unsaved and have the Holy Spirit, then water is not a prerequisite. The Bible says we need to have faith. We need to repent. It doesn't say if you don't get baptized in water, you're not saved. So here they have the Holy Spirit. They're speaking in tongues and they have not been water baptized. 
So water is not a prerequisite to salvation. We should get water baptized. We water baptize every service, every Sunday at our church. I've been water baptized. I recommend everybody, all my kids, I pray will be water baptized. They're not baptized yet because I want them to make their own decision. But I'm not saying don't get water baptized. But what I am saying is it's not salvific. It doesn't make you saved getting water baptized unless you're catholic and you believe that getting sprinkled as a baby but that's a whole different thing that's a catholic doctrine water baptism is not prerequisite to salvation now peter is then called on by the jewish christians and the jewish leaders and they're like uh excuse me what are you doing baptizing gentiles what's going on and peter's like you guys won't believe this the gentiles receive the holy spirit like the people that you guys say are dirty and not of the circumcision they receive the Holy Spirit. This is crazy. And everyone's like, are you sure? He's like, no, I saw it with my own eyes. And now that would be opening up the Gentile world to the gospel. Now we know it works for the Gentiles. And it's okay to disagree. That's completely fine to disagree with me. I'm just telling you, Acts 10, they received the Holy Spirit and they weren't water baptized. So if you think that, then you think they were not saved. They had the Holy Spirit, but they weren't saved. So that's completely unorthodox and wrong, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. Boom. Acts 10, Acts 11. Some of the Christians escape in Acts 11 from the persecution of Saul and God is moving, or so, I'm sorry, some of the Christians who, who escaped from his persecution, who ended up in Antioch, they begin sharing with Jews and Greeks. And the gospel really starts, Acts 12 now, we're starting to see the gospel spreading here. In Acts 12, Herod arrests several Christians at Jerusalem and killed the apostle James by the sword. When he saw that it please the religious leaders he arrests peter and placed him under heavy guards we know that as peter's awaiting to be executed the church is praying for him he ends up getting a jailbreak an angel shows up breaks peter out of jail i want to give you some lessons from the church that prayed at mary's house so peter's locked up and he's going to be executed and the church is praying here's some things we learned we learned they prayed together we learn that the prayer group had rich people, poor people, men, servants, and masters. We learn that the prayer was cons constant prayer. It's a constant prayer meeting. We learn that it was extended time, about eight days. We know that they prayed to God. We know that they prayed all night. And we know that they prayed in spite of their doubts because they had doubts. How do you know they had doubts? Because when Peter showed up, they didn't believe it was Peter. They're like, there's a ghost at the door. Peter's angel, Peter's ghost is at the door. Who is that? Peter's spirit is at the door. So we know that these were the things and the lessons that we learned. And the more they prayed, the more God showed up. Could it have been that if they prayed like that for James, James wouldn't have died? I don't know. But I know that Peter was supposed to die. And because of their prayers, an angel came. So your prayers matter. Your prayers matter. Don't think, I'm just praying like a roulette wheel. It doesn't matter. It does matter. People's lives are at stake. Peter could have died, but because they prayed, God answered, and Peter shows up, and they didn't even believe it was Peter. Sometimes we pray for things, and we don't believe what we're praying for, and the proof is when the answer comes. Come on, share this. 2,500 of you, praise the Lord. That's amazing for just a straight Bible teaching. Share, share, share. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, Herod allows people to worship him. They start calling him a god, and he drops dead. God kills him because God will not share his glory with anyone. He's in the, he ends up being eaten by worms and dying. Acts 13 and 14, and we, we are about what? Of the actual 60 minutes, we're 36 minutes in, and we're on Acts 13. Are we doing good? Um, let's see. We should be, uh, we're, we're about 12 minutes over, but we're, we'll catch up. We'll catch up. We're doing good here. Acts 13 and 14, we're going to put that together. We see a group of powerful prophets and teachers. They meet, they fast, and they pray in Antioch. And the Holy Spirit communicates to these prophets that he wants Barnabas and Saul to take the message of Jesus to the Gentile world. So now Barnabas and Saul are tasked with taking the message of Jesus to the Gentiles. That's Acts 13. The team sails to Cyprus, where they preach in synagogues. At Paphos, the governor wants to hear the gospel, but there's a Jewish sorcerer named Bar-Jesus that kept him from hearing the gospel. But in an outburst of power, Paul stopped the sorcerer and Paul struck him blind. That's no joke. Paul struck him blind by the power of God because he was trying to stop the basically trying to stop the governor from hearing the gospel. Acts 13, 6 through 8 says this. Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This was the governor. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God, but Elimaeus, El 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 oh, these names, the sorcerer, so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from their faith. 
So here we have literally Bar Jesus, a Jewish sorcerer. Sounds like some of these prophets out here, a Jewish sorcerer stopping this governor from hearing the gospel. And so Paul ends up striking him with blindness, okay? From there, from Cyprus, they traveled to Antioch, Pisidia. Paul showed how Christianity grew from Jude, uh, Judaism's roots. When the synagogue leaders opposed Paul, he shares Jesus with the Gentiles. Many believe when the persecution got hot, they ended up leaving. So whenever that persecution got hot, Paul was not dumb. Paul's like, look, I'm not gonna martyr myself. If I'm getting a lot of heat, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna go to the next city. So here we have now, Paul's going to the next city. They end up having an effective ministry in Iconum until a campaign starts where they slander Paul, they turn against him, and they end up plotting to stone him to death. He ends up finding out the plot and heads to Lystra and Derby. So everywhere Paul's going, Acts 13, Acts 14, really throughout the book of Acts, they're trying to kill Paul, they're trying to stop Paul. At Lystra, a layman is healed. People thought Paul and Barnabas are gods. Once again, the apostles are like, they tear their clothes, they dive into the crowd, and they say, look, we're just humans like you guys. Don't worship us. Don't praise us. Turn to the real God. Do not praise us. Paul ends up getting stoned and left for dead. The disciples get around him and Paul quite literally gets resurrected and goes right back to Lystra and preaches. The same place they end up killing him, Paul goes right back to. But again, it's important to note when deliverances happen, when miracles happen, the focus should not be on us. The focus should be on God. This is why I'm sometimes leery, and I'm just going to be tread lightly here, of when we do these long, multiple-hour broadcasts where I'm walking around ministering to people, praying for people, prophesying, all that. I love to prophesy. I prophesy at every altar call I do, but I like to go through the crowd without a camera on me, prophesy to people privately, pray for deliverance, pray for miracles. I don't like making a show out of it. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to do that because I think it's good at times to have God on display. The danger of us always being like, say, just Isaiah out ministering and putting videos out of just me ministering to people and the camera following me around and I'm the only guy doing it. There's no prayer team. There's no church. And again, I'm treading lightly is people start worshiping the person. People start worshiping the person. So we have to be careful that we don't allow that. Paul and Barnabas, the moment people said, you guys are like gods, Paul and Barnabas rip their clothes and jump into the crowd and say, we're just like you guys. Don't worship and praise us. Worship God. So I think some people can do it good if they keep pointing people to Jesus. But I do think we need to be careful at times. I'm not trying to throw shade at anybody. There's no one in my mind. But we do need to be careful at times of the body of Christ that we're not making it all about one person. It becomes a show. We need to make sure that we're using wisdom and humility. And so, yeah, we got to tread lightly with that because there's a lot of danger that's happening in the church right now where it's a one-man show. It's all about one person. It becomes like this worship thing. It's really weird, really cringe, and really unbiblical. Paul says, don't worship us. We're not gods. After preaching at Derby, the team revisits town where they had preached. So they're on a missionary journey. They confirm the believer's faith. They encourage them. They appoint elders in each city. And then they return, return home to their base in Antioch Okay, and a lot of these names are hard to pronounce, so if I'm pronouncing it wrong, um, forgive me. Chapter 15, the Gentile Jewish Fellowship at Antioch disrupt, disrupted by teachers, and I did a long teaching on this in my verse by verse in the, below the playlist. They insist Gentiles must be circumcised. So now they're saying, look, we know the Gentiles are getting saved, but we need to circumcise them. Paul and Barnabas are debating them. The church sent leaders to discuss this. This becomes a whole chapter long ordeal do they have to get circumcised is the question. Thank God the answer is no. They don't have to be circumcised. So they're fighting back and forth. Do they have to be circumcised? Um, all this stuff back and forth. And the, and the answer ends up being no, they don't have to. And the first world church council would come together to discuss this issue. Pharisees, Christians, Gentiles, leaders from all over the literally the known world would come together to talk about is this required? Eventually they would conclude it's not required to be circumcised after being saved. It's not a prerequisite to salvation. And God does not require this any longer under the new covenant. So if you're an adult and you're listening to me right now and you're not circumcised and you're getting nervous right now, no, you do not have to get circumcised. You can if you want, but you don't have to get circumcised now in the new covenant. I still... Listen, I have four girls, so I don't have to worry about it. But if I have a boy, he's getting circumcised. I still believe it's the right thing to do. I still believe it's the clean thing to do. Again, it's not prerequisite to salvation. But as a Christian, if you have a boy, I would still get circumcised. If you have, if, you're, if your wife's pregnant with a boy right now, I know California is trying to make it illegal and trying to ban it and all that stuff. I still believe circumcision is the way to go. And if I have a boy, 
I'll still go, I'll still get him circumcised, but it's not a prerequisite in the new covenant. All of you grown men, don't stress out here. You don't have to go get that done. Paul and Barnabas make plans to go on another missionary journey. The problem happens is they get in an argument about whether John Mark should go along. It becomes so intense that Paul and Barnabas, the dynamite team, they end up splitting up. They end up splitting up. So they go separate ways because basically uh, Paul doesn't want to bring John Mark and Barnabas wants to bring John Mark. So they end up splitting up. Acts 16, it's sad. After they break up Barnabas, after Paul and Barnabas break up, Paul chose Silas as his partner in the head for Asia Minor at Lystra. Timothy's now added to the team as well. And through different hindrances, circumstances, the Holy Spirit ends up leading them to Troas. There, Paul had a vision revealing God's will for them to take the gospel to Europe. This is where Luke joins. Acts 16, uh, verse 6 through 11 is where Dr. Luke joins them at Troas. This will be the time now he's part of the team. At Philippi, a group of women meet at the river to pray. Paul shares the gospel. Lydia, a Philippian businesswoman, believe and is now baptized. Paul then casts out an evil spirit, as you guys know, Acts 16, from a slave girl. Because he cast the demon out, her masters now have no money. Um, they're mad because they're like, well, this is where our prophet was going. And so they end up getting beat, arrested, and jailed at midnight. In Acts 16, they start singing. And as they sing, an earthquake happens breaks the chains, the prison doors open, and the jailer goes, I'm going to kill myself now. He literally wants to take his life because all the prisoners can escape. Paul says, don't do that. Now Paul is going to tell him, here's how you be saved. Now, this is where a lot of people say, this is the sinner's prayer. I'm going to show you why it's not the sinner's prayer. First of all, Paul did not lead him into a prayer. Second of all, the guy that Paul is saying, this is how you get saved, the guy knows if I get saved, I'm going to be like you in a prison cell. So Paul didn't lead him through this watered down sinner's prayer. Paul tells him, look, this is what you need to do to be saved. This is the price it's going to be. The guy's not dumb. The guy knows if I become a Christian, I'm going to be like him. So this wasn't some cheap thing. This is what Paul said in Acts 16, 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all that were in his house. So the jailer, the Jailer in Philippi, the Philippian jailer, this was not some little prayer, repeat after me. Paul says, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. But no, just know there's a price to pay. Because get it? Paul's in prison. The guy knows there's a cost. This wasn't some cheap watered down gospel Paul was preaching. This was clear. The price was everything. Paul and Silas refused to leave jail until the judges apologized for mistreating them. When they left Philippi, a new church was meeting at Lydia's house. So Paul ends up planning a church here. The judges are like, look, bro, we're sorry about jailing you. Um, let's just call it, let's just let you go quietly. Let's not start a riot because those riots starting all over. Everywhere Paul was going, he was starting revivals and riots. And Paul said, no, I'm not leaving until you apologize. I'm a, I'm a Roman citizen. You beat me down. You mistreated me. I need an apology. So that's Acts 16. Acts 70, we're doing good. We're doing good. We have 14 minutes to finish here. About these, these will go pretty quick here. Acts 17, Paul's team. Now, this is all the missionary journeys of Paul. Paul's team preached in Thessalonica. Jews and God-fearing Greeks, including some very prominent women, became persuaded, excuse me, that Jesus was the Messiah. Jealous synagogue leaders accused Christians of being troublemakers. Hello, what else is new? Welcome to uh, Christianity in America. Bereans received the message about Jesus after carefully studying the Old Testament scripture to see if what they were hearing was true. And turns out what Paul was saying lined up with the Old Testament. The enemies that were from Thessalonica came to Berea and stirred up trouble. And then Paul ends up going to Athens. Um, in Athens, Paul addresses the idolatry. He's preaching to pagan philosophers. He's in the marketplace. He's teaching in the synagogue. And the weekdays, he's persuading with the people in the streets. He's saying, you guys have all these altars all around your city. You're worshiping pagan evil gods. And I'm going to tell you about the God that created you. And Paul's preaching there, reasoning in the synagogue, talking to philosophers, preaching the gospel in the streets. When Paul told them about the resurrection of Jesus, the Epicureans made jokes about it. They laughed. They made fun of him. A few people wanted to hear more. A few Greeks, Dion Dionysus and Dem Demaris, Demaris, and a few other intellectuals believed in the Lord. So there was fruit. Paul is there preaching in the um, in Acts 17. Paul is preaching, and there are people rejecting him, laughing at him. But other very intelligent leaders did get saved. There is fruit there. Acts chapter 28. Paul's in Corinth. It becomes a hotbed for all things sexual excess, all things that disguise themselves as religion, sport fanaticism, um, 
all kind of heathen stuff was happening, and Paul's ne Paul's need for support was filled by a couple named Aquila and S Priscilla, whom they worked as tent makers. Paul also worked for a year and a half as a tent maker in the ministry. For all of you that are in the ministry and have a job, Paul for a year and a half was a tent maker. He was working with Aquila and Priscilla. They had a tent making business. He's now in Corinth. Some Jews, including the synagogue president and his family, embraced Jesus as the Messiah. But again, opposition stirs up. Now he's getting kicked out of the synagogue. So Paul starts teaching in people's homes. He's teaching in a Gentile believer's home named Justice because he's getting kicked out of the synagogues. This is Acts chapter 18. Paul felt a great sense of inadequacy as he ministers in Corinth, but God assured him that he had many people in the city. And again, even though Paul has fears, he feels inadequate, Paul keeps speaking. And the Lord keeps protecting Paul in Acts chapter 8. Paul's enemies accused Paul before the Roman uh, governor, Galileo, who ruled in favor of the Christians. And as Paul, leave, Paul left Corinth with Aquila and Priscilla, he demonstrates thankfulness to God, and Paul ends up making a vow in Acts chapter 18. He leaves with Aquila and Priscilla to, in Ephesus, and or leaves them in Ephesus, and goes on to Jerusalem and Antioch. So Paul is basically, I know it sounds like a lot of places, it's very heavy in Paul goes here, Paul goes here. A lot of these Acts 18, 19, 20 are Paul's missionary journeys everywhere Paul is going. And there's also a man named Apollos in Acts 18, an educated Alexandrian Jew, a student of John the Baptist, who arrived in Ephesus and taught in the synagogue. And Priscilla and Aquila, he was very passionate, very charismatic, very zealous, gathering people. And Priscilla and Aquila basically took him under, his, under their wing because he had some gaps in his theology and he taught. He went on to Europe and became a highly successful Christian apologist. But the beauty of the whole story with Apollos is a Priscilla and Aquila took him under their wing and filled in the gaps in his theology. It's beautiful when you have leaders and fathers in the faith taking you under their wing and filling in your gaps. We should never be afraid of people correcting us. Acts 19, Paul meets 12 men who appear to be Christians in Ephesus and says, have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, we don't even know there was a Holy Spirit. We've been baptized um, according to John the Baptist in Jesus' name but they've never received the Holy Spirit. So Paul lays hands on them. They receive the Holy Spirit. Paul teaches in the synagogues in Ephesus until more opposition comes. This is the constant recurring theme. He ends up fleeing. He's preaching in the lecture halls and a lot of strange things happen in Ephesus. Again, Paul's doing unusual miracles. Handkerchiefs are being brought. Paul was working as a tent maker. They were taking his handkerchiefs and laying his handkerchiefs on the sick. And demons were being cast out just from his handkerchief. The sick were being healed just from his handkerchief. Revival broke out. There was a failed exorcism, which led to a massive revival where occult books were being burned in a huge bonfire. Literally, people were just exposing their secrets, repenting of secret sin, witches, warlocks, new agers of the time were getting saved. They were getting millions of dollars worth of witchcraft books, occult items, and burning them in a huge bonfire. I have a whole sermon on this. Literally a failed deliverance, a failed exorcism caused a revival where many people got saved and Paul preached. And there was a powerful impact in Ephesus. And it was so powerful that the craftsmen and those that were selling pagan artifacts and idols were going bankrupt. A revival so powerful, the world was going bankrupt. They're like, we're going out of business. The bars were shutting down. The guys that made little dumb idols were going out of business and it caused a massive riot. The metal workers hated Paul and they caused a riot, which ended up going to the town officials, which is Acts chapter 20. And here we have again, you're like, man, Paul's all over the place. Yes because people are causing riots. Paul leaves Ephesus for Macedonia, where he encouraged the Christians, several companions. Um, he planned to travel to Jerusalem with a gift for needy Jewish believers, but a plot against his life delays his plan, and he has to wait until after the Passover to depart. At a stopover in Troas, Paul went into the Sunday gathering of the local church and preached until midnight. A young boy named Eutychus fell to his death. Paul ends up reviving the young man, and then preaches till the sun comes up. So if you guys think I preach long, like, oh, you do these two hour streams, these four hour streams, you preach so long. Paul preached all night long. In fact, so long, people were falling asleep and a, a young boy fell out of the window and died. And Paul, a boy named Eutychus, Paul raised him from the dead. He ends up stopping at Miletus, Miletus. I don't know how to say half of these. But Paul gathered the leaders of the Ephesian church together for a final farewell. This is where he bid farewell. He would never see them again. He told the uh, Ephesian leaders to follow his example. He talked about the willingness to die for the gospel. 
He warned them that men would come and try to stir the flock with false doctrine to make sure you protect the flock. That was all Acts 20. Paul committed them to God's care, reminded them of the unselfish giving lifestyle, also quoted things that Jesus quoted things, sayings from Jesus found nowhere else in the Bible, and they saw Paul off with hugs, kisses, and tears, and Paul would never see that church that he planted, started, and helped ever again. Acts 21 and 22, I think we're going to make it here. We're at the very, these are real quick here. We might make it here in 60 minutes. As Paul heads for Jerusalem, he knew that he's headed to danger. Fellow Christians told him, do not go. In fact, Agabus prophesied he would be arrested and turned over to the Romans. But despite that, Paul still goes. In Jerusalem, Paul met with church leaders. He exchanged reports of God's work among the Gentiles. They proposed a plan for Paul to participate in purification rites, to put down rumors that he was anti-Jewish. So they're like, hey, Paul, you should participate in some of these purification ceremonies and rites because a lot of people think you're an anti-Jewish teacher and you're teaching anti-Jewish things, which he wasn't, but they accused him of that. The plan ends up backfiring because Paul ends up getting recognized in the temple by his enemies who falsely accuse him of anti-Jewish teaching and taking a Gentile into the temple. A riot breaks out. Here we go again. No, this is not re recap. Riots are happening everywhere. Roman soldiers have to rescue Paul from the murderous mob. Paul then asked the Roman commander to let him speak to the people from atop of the fortress. He told the story of his conversion. When he mentioned being sent to the Gentiles, the crowd erupted and cries for his death. So Paul says, look, this is my story of conversion. I was like this. Now I'm like this. And now I'm being sent to the Gentiles. The crowd erupts and Paul ends up, um, they basically about to interrogate him by flogging. Paul says, look, before you flog me and interrogate me, I'm a Roman citizen. And when Paul said, I'm a Roman citizen, they end up, the torture stopped. They stopped torturing Paul. Paul was taken into protective custody and now is treated with greater respect. Going forward by the Roman government, Paul is treated with greater respect. Acts 23, the Roman tri tribune called a meeting of the Sanhedrin to clarify all the charges against Paul. And now Paul claims innocence. When the high priest ordered him struck, Paul struck back with charges and prophecies against the high priest. So they, in, they physically strike Paul and then Paul gives charges and prophecies against them on how they've, you know, what they've done. Paul declared that the key issue that got him into trouble was belief in the resurrection, which the Sanhedrin began a shouting match between Pharisees who believed in the resurrection and the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. A big shouting match breaks out. Roman troops, troops again, excuse me, have to rescue Paul. Paul's getting rescued again over and over by the Roman troops in a cell that night. Jesus reassured Paul, you're doing the right thing. You're doing what you're called to do, and you will soon be a witness in Rome. Forty terrorists then take an oath to kill Paul. They say, we will kill Paul before we eat. We will not eat again until we kill Paul. Some rulers join this conspiracy. Paul's nephew discovered the plot. Hey, there's 40 plus guys that are going to kill you. They say they won't eat until they kill you. His nephew tells Paul, and then a large force of soldiers in Calvary have to escort Paul to Caesarea, where he was turned over to govern to Governor Felix for trial, which will be Acts 24 through 26. Paul is going to appear before Governor Felix in Caesarea. Paul's pleading not guilty, repeating again the same thing he repeated before on trial. He was on trial because he believed in the resurrection. Felix ends up postponing his verdict and kept Paul in prison for two years. Felix had several conversations with Paul. He trembled, the Bible says, with fear as Paul spoke. Felix was recalled. Festus, in the time that Paul's awaiting his trial, two years in prison, Felix gets recalled. Festus takes over, asks Paul, would you want to be tried in Jerusalem, knowing there's an assassination plot? Paul uses Roman citizen right to appeal to Caesar. Roman citizen had the right to, to go before uh, Caesar. So Paul says, I want to appear before Caesar. King Agrippa visits Festus, a meeting scheduled to hear Paul. Paul had an audience of the government and military leaders about his conversion. When Paul speaks of the resurrection, Festus calls him mad, and Paul asked Agrippa if he believed, and the king responded with a joke line. You almost persuaded me to become a Christian. I have a whole sermon on this. The king, king Agrippa says, you've almost persuaded me to become a Christian. Okay, Acts chapter 27. Again, the reason why I'm saying these go quick is because we've gone through 28 chapters in an hour, and we're about to hit the hour mark in three minutes. Um, but this is all Paul's trial. So there's not a lot to talk about. I've already done all this verse by verse, but this is Paul's trial. trial. Paul and uh, This is Acts 27. We're almost done. Paul and other prisoners, prisoners sail their first leg from Rome aboard a coasting vessel, Luke and Arist um 
Aristarchus. I have so trouble with that name. We're with Paul at Sidon. The Centurion allowed Paul to visit his Christian friends. At Myra, they boarded an Egyptian grain ship, contrary to winds, made staying on course impossible. At Fair Havens, Crete, Paul urged them to stop for the winter, but the ship owner and pilot overruled Paul. Paul said, look, if we go on ahead, they're shipwrecked. They overruled him. And when the southern breeze began to blow, they set sail for Phoenix, but never got there because a sudden hurricane came, swept them down from the northeast, and the ship got caught in a terrible storm on their way. All of those on board gave up hope of survival. They said, we're all going to die. But an angel on the ship, they're all supposed to die. An angel shows up during the storm to Paul and says, everyone's going to survive. Do exactly what I said to do. And on the 14th stormy night, sailors sensed land was near. They tried to escape on the lifeboat. But Paul says, do not go on the lifeboat. Um, we're all going to survive. They cut the lifeboat adrift to keep the cr crew aboard. And before breaching the boat, Paul urged them to eat. At dawn, the ship was headed to the beach. If struck, uh, um, as it was struck, it broke up into the waves and the centurion, the soldiers, ordered everyone to abandon the ship and swim. And they all grabbed planks and they all survived. 276 survived hanging onto wooden planks. And this would lead us to the last chapter of the book of Acts. Now, let me make a special note for all the cessationists in the chat that say, the miracles died out and towards the end of Acts, we don't see miracles. Okay, Acts chapter 28. They all wash up. This is the last chapter of the book of Acts, okay? Paul's trial. He's sent all over from governor to governor, place to place. He's on a ship. Just to recap, because there's a lot of details, a lot of locations. I know I'm going fast. Paul ends up shipwrecked on the island of Malta. Remember, all the cessationists say, oh, you know, the miracles don't happen at the end. They die out. Let's just remember. They're all on the island. They make a fire. Paul and Luke minister to the sick. And now the leader of the island gets sick. And the Bible says Paul heals him and the entire island. The entire island gets healed of sickness. There's literally a miracle service that happens there on the island of Malta. So just for all of the, oh, you know. And guys, remember, in the description, I have 15 hours of verse by verse, every verse in the book of Acts. This is not that. This is 60 minutes, the entire book of Acts. Acts 28, Centurion Julius took prisoners and soldiers aboard an Egyptian ship from Malta to Petuli, to Petuli and two groups of Romans come to escort Paul to Rome. Paul is headed to Rome, and in Rome, Paul lives under house arrest. Leaders and members of the Jewish community came and listened to his message. Sharp division developed among them about Jesus, and having given first chance, first and having given Jews first chance to Paul, he then took the gospel to Gentiles. He remained under house arrest and preached Christ at how, under house arrest without government hindrance until he passed away. Now. I have, again, an entire series. The, the, there's still so many questions at the end of the book of Acts, but I love the way Luke ends it. He ends it with this. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. Paul ends his life teaching the word of God with no one forbidding him on house arrest. Paul's journey in Acts, look at this. Paul's journey in the book of Acts starts with him being knocked to the ground and God saying, why are you persecuting me? And Paul's journey ends with him chained to a guard for years while he preaches the gospel to anyone that will come see him. He starts, look at this. He starts, how beautiful is this, with persecuting people and he ends chained to a guard, persecuted himself, preaching the gospel that gives me chills to anyone that will hear. Starts with him putting people in chains for the gospel ends with him in chains for the gospel. There really is no end to the book of Acts because God's spirit is moving still today. While Paul was chained in Rome, he wrote Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Within a few years of, of Luke's writing, Acts 28, a few years after uh, Luke writes Acts 28, Paul was martyred for his faith. We don't know how Paul was martyred, but tradition says that Paul was eventually beheaded in Rome. Two and a half centuries after Acts 28 in AD 313, Emperor Constantine officially called an end to persecution of Christians. 11 years later, in AD 324, the emperor himself confessed his faith in Christ and declared his intention to make Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. Let me say that again. Two and a half centuries after Acts chapter 28, where Paul is in Rome, murdered for his faith, beheaded for his faith, in AD 313, Constantine calls an end to persecution. And in AD 324, the emperor says that Christianity will be the religion of the Roman Empire. Whoo! That makes me emotional. 
Man, that makes me, I feel like I could, I'm going to cry right now. Paul prevailed the gospel in Rome, martyred in Rome. Man, that makes me so emotional. I, I said the same thing last time I did the book of Acts a year ago, and it made me emotional. But man, when I read this, the history telling us makes me so emotional that Paul starts by persecuting Christian, ends by being persecuted, and then 300 years after he dies, or, or almost 300 years after he dies, they say that the, the, the religion of the Roman Empire will be Christianity. And let me read you. Oh, I get so emotional. Let me read you Paul's final chapter in his final letter. This would be Paul's deathbed letter right here. Are you guys ready for this? I'm going to try to say this without crying. Here is Paul's deathbed letter. The final thing Paul's ever going to write is right here. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Oh, oh, I feel so emotional. Hold on. Okay, give me a second here. Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. This is Paul's final letter. After all of that we read, we read, we just went through the whole journey of Paul. We did it in uh, 64 minutes, 64 minutes. This is Paul, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. This is the climax here. Let me put the chat on screen for the ending here. Okay. As for me, my life has been already poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I've remained faithful. Verse 8. And now the prize awaits me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize, look at this. This is Paul's last words, and we're going to pray. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. What beautiful words. Will you be able to say that at the end of your life? That's the goal. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've remained faithful. Of everything Paul went through, Paul went through catastrophic persecution the last five six seven chapters are hard to understand because it's paul just from place to place getting persecuted yet paul says i finished the race and guess what the beauty is that promise paul says is not just for me it's for all of you that have, uh, look forward to his appearing let's pray tonight let's ask for that baptism of the holy spirit that is the book of acts in 65 minutes we did good we did good we tried to do it in 60 we did it in 65 Let's pray that this is not just a story, but that we could experience the book of Acts, that we could experience the power of God right now. Let's ask for the Holy Spirit. Let's ask, Father, we ask right now for your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray tonight, God, that as we read through the book of Acts, that we would be like those believers, God. Lord, help us to be like those believers, to be like those believers that walked in the power of the Holy Spirit, God. We're praying tonight. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. Fill us, Lord, with your power. Fill us, Lord, with your anointing. God, we want to walk in your spirit. We want to walk in your anointing. We want to be like you. We want to act like you. We want to talk like you. Holy Spirit, have your way. God, do what only you can do in our hearts right now. Remove sin out of our life, God. Help us to repent, God. We don't want to be like Ananias and Sapphira. We want to be like Philip. We want to be like Paul. Lord, we want to be those that preach with power. We don't want to be liars saying we've given everything but only given a part father help us tonight god help us tonight lord to walk in your spirit lord fill us with the holy spirit jesus you said if you ask i'll give you the holy spirit so tonight god we ask for the holy spirit we ask lord fill us with the holy spirit and power fill us with your anointing god do what only you can do in our hearts in our minds in our lives have your way lord have your way in us god we want to serve you. We want to know you. We can't do it without you. The same Holy Spirit that filled them in, in the book of Acts can fill you right now. Just ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Holy Spirit, fill me. Lord, fill me. Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Touch my life, God. I repent tonight. Some of you, you're not saved. You're not saved. You need to repent of your sin and be baptized. Receive the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness. Or, or repent for the forgiveness of your sin. And receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38. Repent. What must I do? You must repent, beloved. There's no way getting around it. You must repent. Father, tonight we repent. We repent tonight, God. And we ask you to save us. Fill us. We need you, Jesus. We can't do this without you, God. Humble us, God. I don't ever want to be worshipped or praised like a God. Lord, let us not be, have these ministries where people worship and praise us. But God, let it be all about you. Let it be all about you, God change us god fill us with your holy spirit and your anointing do it only you can do in our hearts 
forgive us for we've sinned. We've been lazy. Guys, we've been so lazy. I'm talking to myself too. God, we've been so lazy. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to not be lazy. Which reminds me, guys, as we're praying, I'm going to go back to prayer, but let me give this announcement. Speaking of being lazy, September 1st, that's in one month, we are starting the Bible in 90 days. Version Bible app plan. I'll, I'll, I'll do a video announcement. My wife's heading this up. She posted a video on Instagram. So did I about 90 day Bible. We are going to read the entire Bible in 90 days, starting September 1st as a community. We'll be doing videos together, uh, announcing it. And then I'll figure out a way to incorporate this in the stream, check on you guys, make videos about this. But my wife l launched us on Instagram, 90 day Bible challenge starting September 1st. We can't be lazy guys. Let's do this together. Okay. Lord, we don't want to be lazy. That was just an announcement during my prayer reminded me to announce that. We're going to be doing a night, reading the entire Bible front to back, Genesis 1 to Revelation, 90 days. You can do it. I'm going to do it. My wife's going to do it. You version. We're all going to do this together, 90 day. It'll change your life. You're going to be, it's going to be amazing. You can do audio. You can do, it's on the you version. You can download it on Android or on iPhone, but we're going to do this together. We'll announce it soon and all that. Help us, Lord, not to be lazy. Help, I'll tell you guys more about it after this. Help us not to be lazy, God. Break laziness off of us. Lord, for those that are not saved, I pray, Lord, you'd convict their hearts right now and that they would truly turn their life over to you. Not some religious sinner's prayer, but God, let them truly repent and turn their life over to you tonight. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Lord, I pray that you would have your way. Right now, touch hearts, touch minds. In Jesus' name, do what only you can do in hearts and minds. Father, we need your anointing. We need your Holy Spirit. We need your power. We can't live without you. We can't do this without you. Holy Spirit, have your way. Touch right now. Every person watching, touch hearts, touch minds, touch lives right now in Jesus' name. God, do what only you can do. Do what only you can do. Right now, Holy Spirit, have your way. Holy Spirit, have your way. Heal bodies, deliver people, God, just like in the book of Acts. I pray bodies would be healed. I pray demons would be cast out. Every unclean spirit must go in Jesus' name. Every unclean spirit must go in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, have your way. Deliver your people. Heal your people right now, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a great night, guys. What an awesome time. Oh, no, we're losing signal. I want you to pray about sowing. If you were blessed tonight, if you want to sow into this broadcast and keep us going, I want you to pray about giving. Oh, is that not going to work? Uh, do I have a new link? There we go. You can scan the QR code. You can give there. We are starting the Bible in 90 days. My wife is heading this up starting on September 1st. So you have one more month, not starting August 1st, first, which is tomorrow, right? Starting September 1st, we are doing the Bible in 90 days. So it's the Version Bible app. Let me show you guys what it looks like without accidentally leaking my phone number here. Okay, I think we're good. That's the Version Bible app. That's the app that you need, okay? It's a reading plan called the Bible in 90 days. I'll post the link soon. We are going to start a group, but here's the thing, guys. Our community is so big. Last time we started a group, we crashed the app because there's too many, like 5,000 people joined the group and it crashed the app. These apps are not made for communities like ours, which is a beautiful thing, right? There's thousands of us, but if I do a friend group and 10,000 people join, it's going to crash the app and then it's not going to be good for any of us. And we crashed the Bible memory verse app and we wrote the developers and they still can't figure out how to help us because they said there's just too many of you guys. So, um, so into the broadcast tonight, 90 days starting September 1st. Let me also give you guys some announcements. If you don't know, we don't do a five minute intro or announcements anymore because the YouTube trim feature is messed up. A couple announcements. We have the Domino Revival movie. As you guys give, please support the ministry. If tonight blessed you, don't die to dash. There's 2,700 of you. Uh, if everybody gives 25 cents, that will be massive, right? So just help us out there, guys. I'm not a beggar. I'm a believer. If you can't afford to give, don't apologize. Don't feel bad. If you can afford to give on the Venmo or the PayPal or the website, do that. Give monthly, give one time, whatever. I'll read the Venmo and the PayPal here in a minute once you guys start uh, giving there. But a couple things, guys. Let me know if you like tonight. If you want me to do more books of the Bible, I've done the entire book of John in 60 minutes, the entire book of Revelation in 60 minutes, and the entire book of Acts now in 60 minutes. Guys, I've done so much content that I'm just like, Lord, what else can I do? Really, just being transparent and honest with you guys. I'm at the point with 1,400 videos where I'm like, Lord, 
help me, speak to me, what more, what else can I do? I've, I feel like I've done every topic I could possibly think of. And so I'm really just trying to be led by the Holy Spirit and do these videos. They take a lot of hours to prepare, but I'm praying that they bless you guys and they help you guys. The fact that there's almost 3,000 of you in here is amazing. That's all the support I need. So thank you guys. If you can't uh, afford to give, pray for me. Pray for my family. Okay, that's, that's the best way you can support me is in prayer. But let me go over some of these announcements because we didn't do any announcements. That's why. And then we'll hang out with the chat for a little bit and we'll talk and all that stuff. And I should hit stop recording there. It's so weird doing this backwards. It's like totally new for me. Um, and yes, we'll put, you know, I know you guys are like, where's Carl? We got you. Okay, I know I don't put him in the beginning. There you go. There's Carl. Why I give these announcements? For all you that are new in the stream, that's my, my pet bird. All right. We have the Domino Revival movie coming out October 24th. Actually, do you guys want to see the trailer to that? This is the movie, as you guys give, I'm gonna play the trailer to the Domino Revival in theaters, October 24th. The tickets are, they should be linked, but they're putting them in the comments. You can just search the Domino Revival movie and you can find a theater near you. Here's the trailer, let's play that. The Bible isn't the story of what happened. It's the story of what always happens. Society is attempting to redefine right and wrong. God's people are being faced with the decision. Do I bow in fear or stand for truth? It might look like it's dark. It might look like it's impossible. But I say I serve a God who deals in the impossible. Nothing is too hard for him. At his words, demons tremble. The pastors already think I'm crazy, so I don't have anything to prove to anyone anymore. The doctors told you you'd always be on medication. The surgeons told you there's no procedure. You need a physical healing in your body, but I want to give you the healer, not just the healing. This is about the gospel. The reality of God should change everything about our life and the world around us. There were moments where I would cry, and I'd say, Lord, what am I doing wrong? The power went off, and about seven people ran forward with knives. When I was making all these TikTok videos, and no one had any idea that I almost lost my life. I thought this is legit. Is it legit? What are we gonna even do? Our nation and the nations are in revival right now, and what we do is really important. We can like quench this thing out really quickly. I'm putting on the boxing gloves, and I'm going out and going to war against every unclean spirit. Devil, you might have power, but I've been given all power. You are empowered by Jesus Christ. We've worked with close to 5,000 churches. Pastor Mike, you are the fastest growing church in America. God is literally doing something here that we have never seen happen before. God preserves a remnant to bring a revival. We need the glory of the King. I will pay whatever cost I have to pay because I will not give that which cost me nothing. That is fire. That is the Domino Revival, October 24th in select theaters. Uh, it's going to be in several thousand theaters. You can find the link right there in the comments. Guys, what's crazy is this is going to be the second movie we're a part of in theaters, Christian movies in theaters this year. Th that's massively humbling, and uh, I'm just humbled. I'm honored. It's amazing what God is doing, getting these movies out in secular theaters. So make sure you guys go be a part of that. There will be also, I don't think, I'm, actually, I can't say. I, I got to make sure that I have permission to say. I'm not going to say it yet. But I have an announcement about the movie I can't announce yet. But it's something exciting that's going to happen at the theater. Uh, I just almost slipped there. Sorry, Pastor Mike. Okay, make sure you guys get your tickets. I'm going to post them there again in the in the um, comments. Fathom Events slash The Domino Revival. I will be also in Tennessee. This is going to be on September 2nd. I'll be at Global Vision Bible Church Saturday. Preaching there at Global Vision Bible Church. You don't want to miss that. Make sure also, you guys, September 24th, I'll be at Without Walls Church in Mesa, Arizona. I need to post these. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I need to post these on my website. I'm going to post them this week. This week, I'll have them posted. Very important. I didn't announce this. This is very, very important. Then I'm going to hang out and talk to the chat and read all the donations. Very important, guys, is tomorrow there will be no podcast. Boo. Boo. Okay. 
But what are we going to be doing instead of the podcast? Well, Friday night, we'll have the podcast. Friday night, we'll have an in-person studio podcast with Pastor Craig Brown, who is a preacher, pastor, influencer, has millions of followers. God's using him to preach to millions of people. Craig Brown will be on. He's also part of Domino Revival, but he'll be on in studio, in person, Friday night live. So tomorrow's podcast will not be live, but Friday we'll have an in-person live podcast. When I have guests in the studio, guys, the podcast will not always be on Tuesday. It will not always be on Tuesday. So it'll be on Fridays, Thursdays, whatever day my guests are available, that's when it will be. So we are, we are flexible. Friday night will be in the studio live. You don't want to miss that. It's going to be a good time. And I have some other really good guests coming up, lined up, some exciting shows. We have some Demon Slayer podcasts coming. We have some exciting shows coming, some new guests, some guests you've been asking for for three years, and all that good stuff. It's going to be good. Um, yeah, it's going to be great. Okay, so those are the dates. We have an emergency email list that's in the description and in the comments. What's that for? That's for if I get banned everywhere. You guys can go ahead and hit that emergency email list, sign up there. And if I get banned everywhere, which is likely to happen, let's be honest, shout out to Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, anyways, you guys can sign up there and be a part of that. Okay, let me read the donations and hang out with the chat. I've been reading the chat the whole time, if you guys didn't know. But as I preach, I read the chat. It's it's weird, but it's what I do. Uh, thank you so much, Anonymous. Warren and Donna said thank you for all you do. God, is, God bless and you, to you and your family. Warren and Donna. You guys are absolute legends. Let me get some confetti on the screen for you guys. Thank you guys. You guys are amazing. Thank you, Warren and Donna, for all you do, for giving, for partnering. You say thanks for all I do, but thanks for all you do. For real, though. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sharon, so thanks, Isaiah, for staying faithful in the ministry God has given to you. You're truly a blessing. Thankful for the boldness you consistently demonstrate. You are a warrior for, for the kingdom. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate you, Sharon. Thank you, thank you. Okay, those are all the PayPal. I know a lot of you, you guys are like, well, is people not give anymore? No, people do give. A lot of people just give on the website now. So that's why the PayPal is always only like two or three people. Let's check the Venmo tonight, okay? Thank you to all of you giving on Venmo, supporting. Remember, guys, all of our content is free 99. That means we're supported by the viewers, okay? You were at the Breakers Conference? Thanks for being there. I recognize you. Thank you for being there. Appreciate you. Thank you for being there at the Breakers Conference. I, I actually recognize you because now I have my pictures in the chat so I can see you guys' face. Is there any Venmo here? Let's see if there's any Venmo. Yes, go to the Domino Revival, October 24th. Get your tickets now. I'm going to keep... Um, I need... I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to keep announcing it. Okay, okay, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let me make sure these are mine and I'm not reading other people's donations. Yes, Okay. Tara Jenkins, thank you so much. Ruth Nicely, thank you so much. Isaac Carnado, thank you. Corey White, thank you. Nathan Benjamin, thank you. Gabby Hildago, thank you. Stephanie Diaz, thank you. Christian P P um, Pillapil, thank you. Dennis, thank you so much. Shernia Torres, thank you. Claire Bell Maldonado, thank you. And Gina Sadler, thank you so much. That's all the Venmo. Thank you guys for giving. Again, guys, I pray, I don't think we ever will. I can't see a day where we ever have to charge for anything. I pray that we never do. But as long as people keep supporting the ministry and the finances come in, we'll never have to, uh, we'll never have to, what is it called? Charge for anything. We can stay free. And for all those like, oh, you're asking people to give money. Listen, you don't, you don't have to pay anything. You get all this free. So if you're mad about giving, just don't give. Okay, go cry somewhere else. It's biblical. The Bible says to support traveling teachers. The Bible says to sow into ministries. Paul said, if I give you a spiritual things, I should be reaping physical things. So if you don't think it's biblical, just do a five second Google search and you'll see that sowing into ministries is biblical. We're not beggars, we're believers. Our content is free. If we were money hungry, we'd be charging. If I was money hungry, all of my teachings would be one hour long e-courses that I charge $50 for. No shade to anyone that does that. I don't think it's wrong to do that. I'm just telling you, I don't do that. Okay, so if I charged $100, just, if you want to do the math, say I charged $25 for an hour long e course or hour long teaching, and uh, $25 and 2,000 people. <laughs> I'm just saying, say 2,000 of you are like, hey, because these videos get, you know, 50,000, 40,000, 80,000 views, but let's just say 2,000 of you bought it. Uh, that's 50 grand for one hour. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do that. I'm just telling you guys, like, uh, I'm not money hungry. So no one said that in the chat. I'm just telling you, some of you might think that. There's a lot of ways I can monetize. I've taken zero sponsorships. I have 4,000 emails right now of people trying to do ad deals with me, sponsorship deals with me, so I can get on and say, hey guys, buy my HelloFresh box. I don't mind it. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, I don't do that. Thank you, Anonymous, for the donation. I don't do that. So that's all I'm saying. 
Um, yeah, I, I don't think you guys would mind. I don't think you guys would mind if I did sponsorships and partnerships. I don't think you guys would care. I just am not doing it because God's providing. So we're doing everything free. Praise the Lord. All right. When are you coming to Minnesota? I don't know. I'm reading the chat though. 100% all of, and yes, for those of you that keep spamming Carl, 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 there you go. Oh wait, that's a little Carl. That's a baby Carl. Okay. Isaiah, important question. I live alone and work on Sundays. Is it acceptable for me to take the elements, bread and wine, and commemorate Jesus' sacrifice yeah, on my own? Yes, you can do communion on your own. Absolutely. How do you feel about holidays? Uh, some I'm okay with. Some of them are demonic. Depends. Uh, but I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with holidays. Just some of them are, are wrong. Oh, okay, the 90-day Bible plan. My wife is heading that up on Instagram, but we will do an announcement video together. That's going to be starting on September 1st. That's on the Version Bible app. Let me show you guys the app again on the App Store on Android and on iPhone. You just got to go to the 90 day Bible plan. Actually, let me, let me see if I can open the Bible plan for you guys. I did this Bible plan in the past, so it should be already on my plans because I've done the 90 day Bible plan, which is amazing. Actually, I'm going to say this without trying to flex here. It's just, I'm just going to say it. I did. I read the Bible actually in 28 days. If you guys don't know, I read the whole Bible in less than a month and it was about, uh, how many hours a day did I do it for? I think three hours a day, two and a half hours a day. Anyways, that's all beside the point. I'm not trying to flex. The reason why I did the, I read the Bible in 28 days was because I started the 90 day Bible plan, fell in love with it, said, oh, let me try to do three days every day. And that's how I did the 28 days. So maybe this Bible plan will lead you into doing the Bible in a month, which is awesome. The Bible in 90 days is a huge accomplishment, by the way. I'm not trying to downplay that at all. Let me find the Bible in 90 days plan. Why can I not find the Bible in 90 days? Well, I'm going to find it and I'll post it and show you guys. But it's on you version. Let me just type in 90 day. Every word. I don't think this is it. Oh, here it is. Oh, wait, no, that's the New Testament. Bible in 90 days. Here it is. Here it is. Okay, this is what we're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, let me make sure I'm not leaking anything. That's the plan. Just type in 90 days on you version. It's you version Bible app. If you just type in Bible, it's the first Bible that comes up. Yeah, I'm... Uh, <laughs> my wife texted me and said, not trying to downplay as you downplay. No, 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 I'm saying this Bible 90 days got me into reading it in 30. So that this was the thing. And this is amazing and beautiful. Tony and Natalie, thank you. And yes, I'll be doing it as well. My wife is heading it up. We'll do more videos about it and talk about it more. Uh, but go to her Instagram. I also collabed with her on the video so you guys can find it. But this is the Bible plan. You can screenshot that Bible in 90 days. It's amazing. It'll change your life. I promise you. And... This is the app it's on. I was trying to tell the story of why I read the Bible in 30 days was because of this plan. But yeah, I wasn't trying to like weird flex on anybody. And this is the app, which I need to update. Okay, there's the plan. There's the app. It's by Uversion and it's just called Bible. It's the, it's the number one Bible app on all the platforms, okay? Uh, I don't identify as Pentecostal. I am Pentecostal though. So I'm not like Pentecostal, the denomination, but I'm Pentecostal in that I believe in Pentecost. So yeah, I'm not, a, I'm non-denominational though. I don't have, I don't affiliate with any denomination. Mike, if you, if you have a hard time and you're a slow reader, try doing half audio and half reading. So if you're, if you commute, do the audio and then do reading if you can. So if you're a slow reader, just mix it in, mix it up. Will you ever come to Vegas? Possibly. Do you have to pay? No, it's free. Guys, all right, I love you guys so much, but all of you saying like, when are you gonna come here? When are you gonna come here? The only dates I have right now, the only dates I have right now are Tennessee, Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and Mesa, Arizona. You guys know that I'm hardly traveling at all. I'll be at Lifesong again very soon. But yes, Trinity said you made me very proud on the gaming stream. Can you believe the gaming stream is almost at 90,000 views? That's insane. Yeah, I have, I played a Christian game. Um, to support them because I want to support Christian media. And uh, yeah, there it is on my channel. It has almost 90,000 views, which is crazy. How do you like New Jersey? It was great. We had a great time, except for they shut down our event the second day and the owner was manifesting and all that. It was crazy. Can you absorb all the Bible in 90 days? Yeah, it's like 45 minutes a day. You could definitely absorb it in a day. For sure you can. For sure you can absorb it. 45 minutes a day, you can do it. I have a I have a review of The Chosen already. I have literally, I streamed the whole season of The Chosen on my channel. 
We love you, Isaiah. Well, I love you too. Thank you. Yeah, I streamed the whole season three of The Chosen. It's super funny because I was the first one to stream The Chosen when it released because I was I was streaming on release. So now I have <laughs> this is so this is how broken YouTube is. I have like the YouTube copyrights to The Chosen now. So anyone that uploads a, a clip or they're chosen on their page, it comes up on my page saying, "Do you want to copyright strike them?" Which is so weird. Of course, I would never do that. But yeah, it's it's. I was looking at it today. I'm like, this is so crazy. How do I mark all is red? I don't know. Thank you, Tyson Chicken Nugget. Appreciate you. Yeah, the, the game stream was fun. Uh, it was fun. I got to joke and have fun and all that good stuff. Yeah, I had Dallas Jenkins on my live. Type in Dallas Jenkins and Isaiah Saldivar, and I interviewed him. Can you do Exodus in 16 minutes? Um, I could try. I've never done the Old Testament. I could try. I, the U version friend group, we're looking into it, but I don't think we can do it with how many of us there are. Because we tried doing the Bible memory group and we literally uh, crashed the app. Like the app's unusable now for me because I made a group and like 5,000 people joined it and then the app crashed and now I can't even use the app for the Bible memory app. Froze me, froze me out of the app. Isaiah, can you live stream the game when it comes out? My little sister liked it. And possibly, I will probably... Now listen, I'm not going to become a gaming streamer. Okay, so when it comes out, I might do it to support them, but I'm not going to be like replacing my preaching with gaming streams. That's just not going to happen. It, it felt so easy. I'm like, uh, you know, I'm like, man, I could sit here and talk all day and, to you guys because when I stream, I have to actually do talking and thinking and pre preparation. But if I was a video game streamer, I'd probably stream like eight hours a day, to be honest. But no, we will not be doing uh, gaming streams. What church do you go to? Life Song in Stockton, California. So yeah, let me know if you guys have any other questions while I'm here because I'm going to get off soon. Zach Ryan, 60 minutes. I'll do more 60 minutes if you guys liked it. I know it's like speed running and you're like, oh, it's so quick, but it's kind of fun. And I talk fast already, so it's kind of enjoyable. Nick, uh, Isaiah. Yeah, I, everyone calls me Nick A30. You're awesome. Thank you, Laser. All right, what else you guys want to talk about? Do you have to read the Bible out loud or to yourself? Oh, you could read it to yourself. I want to do another 12-hour stream. I did the reading the entire New Testament. If you guys don't know, you can look that up as well. I, the title's called This Stream Doesn't End Until I Finish the New Testament. And I did a 12-hour live stream where I just read out loud the New Testament. It was way harder than I thought, but it was fun. So I want to do another long stream doing something. I don't know what yet, but we'll figure it out. What version am I going to do? I'm going to do for the 90-day, the NLT. Because I usually read the New King James, but because I want to just read and relax, I'm going to do the, the NLT. Read the whole Bible in one stream. The Bible's about 60 hours, 50 to 70 hours. So I don't think that'll work. Clinton Terriano, say God bless you. It's been a while since I've watched your videos. How have you been? Miss you, bro. Thanks, bro. I miss you, Clint. I don't know why you've been gone, but appreciate you, man. What if I did, okay, 60 hours? Hmm. Don't start giving me ideas, guys, because you guys know I'm crazy. You guys know I'm I'm too radical about everything. So, 60 hours, 8 hours a day, 7 and a half days. Hmm. I don't know. Should I do a <laughs> should I do a subathon what all the streamers do where they go live for like a week? I don't think that would work. What if I did 12 hours a day? 12 hours a day. Five days. 12 hours a day live. What if I was live for five days and did 12 hours a day? That's too much. Don't get me started. I'll literally do it. I'll literally do it. That's too much. I would have to do... Hmm. Guys, don't get me started because now I'm thinking. I would have to do... Reading on my, I would have to go live on my phone or mobile somehow and incorporate my wife and kids and do like, I don't know. I don't think I could do it. I, I can't see a, I can't see a place where I do it. Oh, I can't see a way to do it. Read the whole entire Bible in one stream. Two hours a day for 30 days. Oh no, I've already done the Bible. I've done the Bible. Oh no, I'm talking about reading the whole Bible in one sitting. 
in one stream. Like the stream doesn't end until I finish the Bible. People have tried to do it before and they they weren't able to. It's 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 intense. Honestly, the 12 hour stream I did or 13 hour stream I did was way harder than I thought. By the book of Revelation, I kid you not, I was seeing stuff. I was like, yeah, by the, by the, oh, I can revert to previous version. By the book of Revelation, I was, I was, um, I'm pretty sure I saw Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like in my office floating. I was literally seeing like three different things and it was just crazy. Reading for 12 hours straight is uh, not, don't recommend it. Okay. Christian movie recommendations. Oh man. Come out, go watch Come Out in Jesus Name on Amazon Prime now. I don't really know what good Christian movies are there. I don't really watch movies. They they bore me. Yes, I'll only be preaching Saturday in Tennessee. I'll only be preaching Saturday in Tennessee. How's your dog doing? My dog is doing good. My dog was sick yesterday, but it's because my kids always feed her random stuff, but she's doing good. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of doing the 90 day Bible thing. It's 45 minutes a day. I mean, if I went live, uh, I don't know. That's too much. I don't know. I'm trying to think of ways we can incorporate it into the content. We'll see. Okay, let's see. Southern Gospel. Where are you from, Isaiah? I'm California, Central California. I don't want to tell you the exact city I live in, but I'm from Central California. My church is in Stockton, California. Watching with the family right now. Hello, Mike Jennings and the family. What up, Jennings family? We're almost done, guys. We're going to be getting off here in a minute. I'm just reading a couple more questions. We've been live for an hour and 45 minutes. But we did do the entire book of Acts in 65 minutes, which I didn't think I was going to be able to do. Carl baptized. I mean, he's a virtual bird, so, you know. Uh, does your live, wait, does your live stream service do more 60 minute books? Okay, I will. I'll mix them in. War Room's a great movie. Someone said, guys, the chat's moving so fast. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best to read it. I'm trying. Leave Carl on. Well, Carl blocks the whole chat. I'll leave the little Carl on. Because the big Carl blocks the whole chat. Unless you want me to just be this and talk like this. Hold on. Let me see. Oops. Wait, what's going on here? Give me a second. Where did I? There we go. There you go. I got you. Carl has taken over my stream. All right, let me read the chat now. Oh, don't move your head, Carl. How did Carl start? I don't know. I downloaded it as a joke. I was like, I'll get the bird off the screen if you guys like the video and people wanted him to stay. So he just became a thing. What's your favorite stream? I don't know the favorite stream I've done. I've done a lot of streams though. I have 1400 videos and a lot of them are live. It's hard to recommend kids movies or shows because we basically just monitor what our kids watch and don't allow certain things like witchcraft, magic, and stuff like that. Like we don't allow supernatural stuff in their shows. But um, so it's hard because I don't know like all the exact names of the stuff. We just, it's more like you're not allowed to or you are allowed to watch it. But like Superbook is always good. Someone said I just gave him a kiss on the head. Okay, that's getting weird. <laughs> it's getting weird if you're kissing the screen. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm scared. We're gonna have to take him down. Yes, my church live streams. Life Song Church. Um, the Passion Translation, I haven't really read it much. I bought it a long time ago when it first came out, but I've heard a lot of discrepancies with them and a lot of like negative things, so I just have stayed away from it. I haven't done enough research, so. What do you mean by pre-trib and post-trib? Pre-trib believes that the tribulation, we get raptured before the tribulation, Post-trib believes we get raptured after the tribulation. I'm post-trib. Please interview Dan VAC. Okay, I'll look him up. Dan VASC. Oh, I was kidding. I didn't really kiss him. Okay, cool. Yeah, that was a little bit weird if you start kissing the screen while I'm on it. Passion translation is no good. I don't know enough about it. 
You should grow your facial hair. I did, uh, but I shaved. Yeah, I'll do a meetup for the Domino Revival movie. Yes, October 24th, we will be doing a meetup again. Isaiah, would you consider me not saved because I smoke cigarettes? Let's see, hold on. Hey, Isaiah, would you consider me not saved because I smoke cigarettes? I quit marijuana eight years ago and I don't drink at all. Uh, Christopher, I don't think you're not saved because I don't think that smoking a cigarette takes away your salvation. But I, but I do believe my personal conviction is that it is a sin. Remember, sin is two things. Number one, it's breaking God's laws. And number two, it's missing the mark. That's literally what sin means. Those are the two definitions of scripture. So I do believe if you're smoking cigarettes, you, we know you are killing yourself slowly. Like you literally are. It kills you. It, 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 it destroys your body. So um, it does kill you. And, and it is a bad witness, right? You're witnessing to people while smoking. So I would say like, I think it is sin, but I don't think you're, I don't think it's going to take your salvation or like you're going to go to hell because you smoke cigarettes. You might, I don't know. I don't know you. But again, I'm not going to say you're not saved because you smoke cigarettes. I would say pray that God would deliver you, set you free and throw away all your cigarettes, cigarettes and stop buying them. Do whatever you have to do, the gum, the patch, whatever you have to do, because it's literally like destroying your body. Like actually. Do you have a live schedule? Yes, Monday, Tuesday, and Friday at 6 o'clock usually. I'm pretty much always live Monday and Tuesday. This week's different because my p podcast will go from Tuesday to Friday. Next week, I'll be gone, so I won't be live. I'll have pre-recorded content. But then that's, that's uh, you know, we have a, la a lot, a few last trips of summer with our kids before they go back to school and uh, things get busy. So, yeah, or things go back to normal. So, but yeah, I would definitely pray about quitting smoking. Do your best to quit. Isaiah, what is need? What is need to watch TV? I put away all TV now. I watch The Chosen too much. Uh, do I have an addiction? I mean, you. I can't tell you if you have an addiction. If it's taking the place of God, probably. But no, if you have spare time and you're watching The Chosen, there's nothing wrong with it. Again, guys, I don't think there's anything wrong with TV or video games. It just the content of what you're watching or playing. That's the thing. Or if it becomes an addiction. Like for me, I used to be addicted to video games. So God said, give it up. It was an addiction. I was playing eight to 10 hours a day. Do you pray before you eat? Usually, but it's not required. Re need resources about demonology? I have 50 plus videos, Liam. Go to my deliverance training on YouTube playlist. Go to playlist deliverance training. I have so many videos. Uh, do a podcast with Jenny Weaver. I've done like seven or eight with Jenny and I'll have her on again for sure. She's the, I think she's the most, I've had her on the most more than anybody, I think. Put Carl on the screen. Okay, 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 okay. Stop yelling at me, please. I'm scared. Let me make them smaller. He takes up the whole chat. That's the problem. You guys love Carl, don't you? Who is it? One of my kids is knocking at my door. Just type in Isaiah Saldivar and Jenny Weaver. Your, your best friend is... The search on my page. Can Christians be possessed? No, I've never taught Christians can be possessed. I teach Christians can be demonized, not possessed. So whoever says Isaiah teaches Christians can be possessed, never watch my teachings. I've said like a million times, I do not believe a Christian can be possessed. All right, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. I'll be live on Friday night. Um, and yeah, I'll have content this week, probably some clips and some videos. Maybe I'll have... Let's see. Maybe not. Because I'm very busy this week preparing for next week. Because I'm going to be gone next week. So I need to film week this week for next week. And I have a bunch of stuff going on. So yeah, we'll figure it out. But I'll be live for sure Friday night at the studio with Craig Brown. Pastor Craig Brown, which will be an amazing time. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. I'll see you guys Friday. Great night tonight. I'll have content posted this week. Make sure you like, subscribe, go to the second channel. I post on the second channel every day. Let me make sure I post that in the comments. So if you're like, I need more Isaiah content, go to the second channel. Because we are posting clips for you guys all the time. There's the second channel. Go there. Lots of videos, lots of clips. Love you guys so much. Thanks for partnering and donating. If you partner monthly with us, you will get 70 sermons, 20% of the merch store. Thanks for doing that. Love you guys. Have a great night. I'm getting off here. Love you all. Thank you. Good night, Steph. Loudly. Thanks for listening. Good night, Legacy. Good night, Tyson. Good night, Brandon. Good night, Gothic. Eric. Colleen. Robin. 
Threshing Sledge, thank you, thank you, thank you. Pyrex, Camilla, thank you guys. You guys are amazing. Love you guys. Goodbye. Oh, hey. Didn't see you. I was just chilling down there listening. If this, if you've enjoyed this video, go ahead and hit the like button. Super easy, super free. Helps a lot. All right, so right now, stop what you're doing. Hit like. Okay, I'm going back down here. Bye. This is Come Out in Jesus' Name by... Yeah, Come Out in Jesus' Name by Jeffrey Jocelyn. Love you guys. There's power in the blood, and that's never gonna You guys are awesome. Thank you. Let every tongue confess that Jesus is the king. And one accord, we're moving forward. Break every chain. Demons start to travel. Love you guys. Have a good night. You know we have to have the dancing bird for all the haters. Can the Heresy Hunters please add, please add Carl to one of your videos and expose him, please? Tell me how weird I am for having a bird on my stream. Thank you. Love y'all. We're the best community on YouTube. Tell everyone you can. Turn the darkness and the light. So let the fire begin. Demons start to tremble. Devils go insane. They're afraid of Carl. They don't want the smoke. They try to run away. They can try to lie, but they're out of time when they hear the same. Why it's so funny either it makes me laugh as well Love you guys. Appreciate you guys. I will see you in the next live stream. Thanks for being here. Thanks for partnering. Thanks for giving monthly. Thanks for allowing me to do this full time and uh, build this amazing community. Three years strong and we're just getting started. I love you all. Appreciate you all. Thanks for being here. Have a good night. Bye. Come out in Jesus name. If you're still here, I just want to give you a special thank you for staying to the very, very end. I have a special announcement for you. Just kidding. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for staying this whole time. I really am honored to be a part of this community and to lead this thing. And it's just, I'm living the dream, being able to preach the word of God and being able to be a part of this, what God is doing. So I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. I'll see you soon. I'll try to get live maybe spontaneously this week sometime and all that. All right. Good night. Love you guys. Bye.